All well, right. let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Sarita Dua. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and myself, along with my lovely co-host Via Williams, we're so honored to host this episode of Power Playbooks. Every two weeks, the um, second and fourth Wednesday of the month, we interview amazing agents and business owners and operators and have them share their playbook on exactly what's working for them. Our goal is to get in the weeds as much as we can so that you can actually, we don't stay pie in the sky. We want to give you tactics and ideas that you can implement with your business right away. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Via, who's going to announce our guests today. We're really excited about today's session. Yeah, for sure. And please um, interact, um, throw your questions on chat. Um, we want to, we want to get your feedback and your questions and we'll, we'll try to get through them all. I am super excited to have Denise Oseguera live from Mexico on her vacation. Are you going to show everybody <laughs> your view that you showed us? It's, it's beautiful. Should I? I'll yeah. do it very quickly. Why not rub it in? Sacrifice. You are here for us, and that is your view. I just want everybody to know the sacrifice that you're making. And we've got Jamie Lee on. Hi, Jamie Lee. Hi. Uh, you guys are in the Atlanta area. You have Live Free, the Live Free Atlanta team. We're going to talk all about it. And um, first, though, before we start talking all about it, why don't you guys walk us through what your team looks like today and what each of your roles are, you know, how you guys came together as partners, what you each kind of spend your day doing. I think that's always interesting to know how partners work together and what their origin story is. Yeah, absolutely. So Jamie Lee and I met, I want to say it was 2017, 2018. We worked together on a different um, mega team within Keller Williams. And we both had different roles. So at the time she was the top producer on the team. I was the director of operations. So we lived in very different worlds, but we worked super well together and we became friends and worked as kind of as partners within that business. We both left that team for different reasons. And w we knew that we wanted to stay in real estate, but didn't know what our futures looked like in real estate. As many people have um, with us being on a bigger team, we saw a lot of challenges with teams, the way that they're run and kind of identified that we did not want to have a big team, that if our future was in real estate and our future was in real estate together, it would just be the two of us. So we kind of started in that direction. And then as we realized, okay, we're, we're actually pretty good at this, the production part and the running a business, we started looking for direction in our goals and how we would achieve them. And through, we got, we got hooked up with a coach, of, um, with board coaching at that time. And when we would go over our goals with him, he'd say, Oh, so you want to build a team? And we'd say, well, no, 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 we don't want a team. We don't want everything that comes with a team. We don't want turnover. We don't want empty promises. We don't want to offer value and not provide it. And so we just resisted. And then the more he dug into the goals, the more we realized that was what our future was going to be. Um, so that's kind of where we started growing. And we we knew we had different strengths, me coming from an operations background and Jamie Lee being really used to doing high, high volume. So that kind of, I think, supported us in our decision to build a team. And I think, Jamie, I'll let you add to that, Jamie Lee. Um, yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up. There was a, we, as Denise said, we left um, the same team for different reasons and at different times. I left before she did and tried out the solo agent route, which didn't go very, didn't last very long at all. I realized that really wasn't for me, which is kind of how Denise and I ended up back together is because I knew I couldn't work on my own. I just wouldn't work. So I think that had, we knew we wanted to be with people. We just didn't want it to be the wrong people. Yeah. You know, I always say that people say, well, I, I think I want to start a team and I, I ask why, and there's all these different reasons, but the real reason to start a real estate team is to execute a business plan that's bigger than one person. You know, if you think about it, and that's really what you were describing, Denise, you're like, you know, everything that we were describing we wanted was going to take more than one person, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I think you add, asked a little bit about our roles. Yeah. We um, right now, currently, and even from when we started, we were both in production. So we didn't fall really naturally into these two. Like we didn't have this, I'm going to be operations, you're going to be production. We overlapped a lot on a lot of different items. 
And the more we grew, the more of a challenge that that presented. So what we ended up doing is it wasn't really fair to say, well, one person will take on this whole thing because really we're partners and we work on everything together. So instead, what we did is we took accountability and ownership over items on our GPS, and then we headed up the responsibility of getting those items completed. So I tend to lean a little bit more in the operations side where Jamie Lee tends to lean a little bit more in the training and um, lead generation side. Yeah. But we're both very integrated into everything in the business. And you're both producing. And I think what's interesting is you're both producing about equally, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's good. That's good. So let, let's let kind of start with uh, agent growth, if that's okay. Um, you have uh, about how many agents on your team today? We have 14, counting with me and Denise. Including you two, great. Um, beginning of 2023, so the beginning of last year, how many did you have? We had six agents. Okay, so we've gone from six to 14, which I think is a really nice steady growth. Let's talk about that. Um, what what made you start recruiting? Because I know when I talked to you, you were like, we loved our vibe. We loved our culture. You were really reluctant to recruit, right? When you had those six agents. So let's start there and talk about what would make you risk that tight knit group, that great group everyone was producing and start growing. I think it's funny that you say we came off as reluctant because I think that's an understatement. Like we have (laughs) fought recruiting and and, uh, agent growth at every step of the way only because we feel like our priority, our main priority is our culture and then how much value we can add to our agents. So what we realized is when we started last year, um, one of the main reasons that we partnered with Place primarily was because when we started recruiting just to our small team, we felt like we were going to be asking a tremendous amount or a tremendous ask from these agents that were growing their businesses that were partnering with us. And we needed to find a way to give back a tremendous amount of of value back to them. And we didn't feel like we had that value built in. So our partnership with Place was kind of a no-brainer at that point when we had that mind shift that the most important thing was bringing age value to those agents. So the recruiting really started when we figured out the more that we can grow, the more that we can offer our agents. And that becomes with resources, with production opportunities, um, even with partnerships through other uh, lenders and um, title companies, the more that we grew, the more that we could offer them. And that gave us enough motivation to grow and to grow in a way that really protected our culture. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So, so you decided that, you know, and you're like, we have a value opportunity that we can now recruit to that we're comfortable recruiting to. Another way to say that, by the way, I think is you felt really comfortable that you could take an agent's existing business or take a new agent and get them to a, a six figure life. Right. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to. And so um, what did you do to start recruiting? Well, first, we uh, turned to Brevity Marketer because <laughs> we were, you know, we were starting from scratch. We had never really recruited before as far as we had a, a few agents on the team, but they all came pretty organically to us. Um, so we started with the basics, just using, you know, the tools we have through Place and Brevity Um and going that route, uh, which we did have success with. And I I would say, Denise, and remind me if I'm wrong, I think we're about half and half on the agents we've added since 2023 on through Recruiter and through Organic uh, Connections. Yeah, I would say it's probably a third Recruiter, a third like agents that we have kind of met and worked with or um, networked with throughout the years. And then another third of that would just be like uh, sphere referrals and people who saw our posts on social media that maybe we didn't have a relationship before, but that had been watching us from afar or had some sort of connection to us. Yeah. Okay. So we call it recruiter AI now. I don't know if you guys knew that it's recruiter AI and it's going to be um, out to the public soon. And I, 
I don't know if you guys, if we talked about this before, I am a massive advocate of that software. I have been a professional recruiter since 2018, and I've never had recruiting software that good. So I'm mean, like, I'm a massive fan of it. So you threw in some ads, uh, Recruiter AI kind of helped you keep those fresh, rewrite them, retitle them, all of the things that it does. It just so the public knows it, it then codes it with its AI into an appropriate auto plan that automates response time. So these recruits are getting message and they're getting all of these automated responses, even if you don't get around to it, if you miss that. And if they're a new agent and it comes from a new agent ad, it knows to put it to a new agent auto plan. If it's experienced, it puts it to that. It's like stunningly amazing. Like it's that good. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'm overselling it because I've used some crummy recruiting software. So, so you did about a third, a third of it that way, and then a third of it referral, and then a third sort of word of mouth and whatnot. What is? Did you have like a streamlined process to do it? Did you guys kind of figure that out along the way? Did you have it nailed right away? How did you, how did you kind of start it, and what does it look like now? The process. Yeah. Well, one thing about us is that we can procrastinate on something we don't oh. like to do until the end of time. So we really have to put a system in place because if there's not something that is forcing us to do the things that we're not comfortable doing, then we'll find ways to procrastinate. So we started just putting the ads out there, not even because we felt like every um, candidate that came in was going to be this amazing, perfect fit for our team, but because we weren't having enough conversations yet to just the same way you don't lead generate. If you don't lead generate enough for your buyers and sellers, you're not going to have enough buyers and sellers. We weren't having enough conversations with agents to be able to say, this one's a good fit culturally. This one's not a good fit culturally. So the first thing that automating the recruiter AI and having even just job postings out there did for us is give us the opportunity to have more conversations. And the more conversations we had within that realm, the more we identified what kinds of uh, obstacles that agents run into in their business and how we might be able to serve them and have better conversations around that. So because we have this reluctance, right, and we build this system and we're so focused on our current agents producing, we decided to kind of batch recruit at the beginning of the year. And we decided just let's go out and find three to five people that we feel like are a really good fit for our team. And then let's just spend the months after that focusing on getting them into production and making sure that our current agents have what they need. And that's what we did at the beginning of the year is we actually um, partnered with five new agents, well, in different stages of their careers, and then spent the following few months focused on helping them get into production and getting into the rhythm of things on the team. How how to go? How many of them got into production? Almost all of them and all, almost all of them. And we have kept all but one, I think. Yeah. Yeah. One Good. thing we've been really proud of is just minimal turnover, um, which is more of a, a product of us not growing by large numbers so far. So Denise, that's a perfect segue into a question that we have from Jill. She says, I've grown multiple times to 14 plus agents and continue to lose agents over and over again. Have you had turnover yet? And and how and who are you hiring? So, so you, meant, you nailed it in the sense that if you don't have a lot of turnover, perhaps you're not growing as much, right? So, but would love to hear your thoughts on that, you know, sort of your growth trajectory and turnover. Yeah, and I have some thoughts, but I think I'll let Jamie Lee start because we she's we've kind of been doing thinking a, a lot in this area right now, and I feel like you can kind of lead that conversation. Yeah, so um, this is our first time with fourteen agents, so you know we can't speak as if we're um, rock stars at this just yet. But I think one thing that we talk about a lot is our culture is super, super important to us. It's one of the things like Denise were, and I were holding on to so tightly um, to not grow that we are really super cautious about keeping that in the forefront of everything that we do. So really, I feel like a lot of what we do as a team is all a group effort. Um, we get the agent's input on most of everything that we do. 
um, from our standards on the team, which we decided as a group, what do we feel like a successful agent would be doing day by day, week by week? Um, we get their input on what they feel like is working and what's not working. And we do those things because we feel like it, it, not only are they being heard, but we're hearing them, right? And so we can then adapt what we're doing um, to make sure that their businesses are running the way that they want them to and as successfully as we want them to. And I think we we get to cheat a little bit because there are two of us and we are equal partners and we are equal in the way that we treat, like the, the amount of time that we spend with our agents. So we are able to give them more attention maybe than traditionally one team leader would. Um, our personalities sometimes on different days go better with different agents. If one age, if there's a situation where someone doesn't feel comfortable with one of us, they might feel comfortable with the other. So I think that we do, we definitely have an advantage in having each other in that realm um, because we, we get to offer, we, we get twice as much, I guess uh, they get twice as much access. And even from a standpoint, I know retention and loss of agents, I feel like is one of the hardest things mentally that we go through as team leaders, because it's really hard not to take it personally. It's really hard not to feel guilt that you didn't do something. It's hard not to feel disappointment at that agent for not having shown up the way they did potentially. So when you have someone to kind of brainstorm that and go, okay, well, our feelings are hurt. Um, we feel bad at ourselves because we didn't do this, but also what did we learn from it and how do we not do that with the next agent so that doesn't happen again. And sometimes it's hard to have that conversation with someone that you don't feel like is as equally guilty and responsible as you are. Um, you guys, I love that. You guys went, you know, from a batch recruiting to now you're at a cadence of one a month. What what made you make that change? And what is your current goal? Like, what do you want to kind of be at by the end of this year? Well, Via, I think you might have made us change that uh, with the last conversation <laughs> we had. And um, I think I'll, you and maybe you want to you're going to say it a lot better than I do. Um, but essentially, by batch recruiting, we're missing out on. Can you say it? Because I just know you're. <laughs> well, I, I was trying to Use drive the word comes. Comes. Say it. <laughs> Well, my my comment to you and to my clients is, is that, you know, Batch recruiting is fine. And I actually want to preface this by saying you you had this reluctance and you jumped into the arena and you did it. And kudos to you. Kudos to everybody who does that, number one. Number two, it's not a bad thing to start with a batch like you did. There's nothing wrong here with the scenario because you knew you were going to devote a ton of time to the first group of people. Makes sense to me to have that be a bigger group, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. My comment about batch recruiting and why I prefer a cadence of one or two or three or 10 a month versus everyone at once is that you're only taking the available candidates that are available in a particular moment of time when you batch recruit. But if you have a cadence and a process of recruiting that's ongoing, you are having a way, way wider berth of candidates who are available throughout the year. Right. And you could be missing out on talent because you decide to batch recruit in January and the next Michael Jordan of real estate and the next Ben Kinney of real estate comes in June. And but you weren't recruiting in June, you would miss them. Yeah. So I do like a cadence, but I, I think it's great that you started that way. Yeah. Well, and with that. Oh, go ahead, Jamie Lee. Well, I was just going to add one more thing that we kind of realized through Drew, our coach, is I was having a huge roadblock mentally on recruiting because, as Denise mentioned, I'm more over the production and training side with the agents. And we were having agents who weren't hitting their goals still. And I told Drew, I was like, I don't want to recruit anymore until I'm perfect at this because I don't want to keep letting agents down. And what I realized is not everyone is going to show up the way that you think they're going to show up, no matter what they say when they interview, no matter how awesome, you know, they seem like they're going to be. And even if they have the same access to the playbook and the tools and the systems as everyone else, everyone's not going to use it. So we kind of had that little breakthrough that we can't wait for perfection to get the right people in the door. 
You know, I heard a, a, like a life shifting comment last week that hasn't left me. That's probably going to be one of my new DHBs, deeply held beliefs. And that is that it's our job to provide value. It's the client's job to extract it. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's the agent's job to extract it. We just, we can't control that variable, right? And so when we're recruiting and we're talking about retention, we always have to look in the mirror and say, what can we do better? And we have to, we have to analyze that. And we just have to know the math and just know a percentage won't make it. And that really doesn't have anything to do with you, right? It's, it's not an excuse to not examine and inspect what we expect though and get better. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's an interesting um, transition because I think one of the other things you guys have done extraordinarily well is um, be really, you guys are great leaders. You, 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 um, you really represent a vulnerable form of leadership that I relate to. But one of the things you, you did is you go, look, we have to expect what we expect. And you gathered your team together in person and you asked a really brave question. What was it? And how did that go? Tell everybody about that story. Um, Denise, do you want me to take this one? Yeah. Um, so this was just, it kind of came to us after a call that we had with Ben that, you know, not everything is having the traction and the results that we're looking for. And rather than Denise and I sitting there and trying to figure it out, like, let's go to the agents, let's go to our staff and see what do they think is working and what do they think is not. So we kind of surprised them with this exercise. They didn't know it was coming. They came in for, you know, their regular coaching session and we sat them down and we had, I think, what, like 35 questions. I mean, it was, it was so extensive. It was, it was so an extensive much. questionnaire. Um, and we, you know, told them like, hey, we want you guys to be brutally honest. We're trying to improve everything so that y'all want to take advantage of this and so that everybody can see better results. Um, we asked them to, we told them we would turn our feelings off for an hour, like say whatever you want. We can take it. We promise. And just really dug into everything from how we do Legion, how they like brevity. Are they using Mojo? Are they happy with how their transactions are being processed? Literally everything from start to finish. Um, and we spent a full hour on that and got a lot of clarity. I think we were surprised by some of the answers and some of them we weren't, but we walked away from that with a, a few action steps and things that we can implement. Okay. Yeah. So and I think that's brave ladies. I think it's really brave to go, okay, what do you really think about this? And what do you, whatever. So I want to go deeper. So Denise, like what really came up? Tell us some of the, like, cause that's a hard thing to ask. Yeah, well, I think a couple of things that stood out to me. One, there were a few like power ups for us. We had our, we have, we have felt like, are we doing this right? Like, it's not getting the traction we want. We don't feel like it's effective. And when we asked those questions, that came back to us as they also felt that way. So, one thing is like your instinct about what is not going well in your business is probably pretty accurate. And to find out sooner, allowed us to make changes sooner, which allowed us to be more valuable more quickly. Um, and then also it's hard to ask. I mean, it's hard to look them in the face and say, well, how do you feel about your leadership? Do you feel like you can come to us? Do you feel like the culture is good? Do you feel like we are accessible? And I, I think the really cool part of this exercise, and I actually think it outweighed any negative any negative feedback we got, but the positive was just hearing all of the things that they loved because ultimately every agent that we're partnered with is on the team for a reason. And so to hear them almost defend the reasons, not because anyone was attacking them, but because the question was, you know, is this thing valuable? And they're like, yeah, that's, you know, that's amazing. That's what, um, that's why we're on the team. And then also it was really cool to find just some, accountability and some ownership from them about it being their team and how they wanted their team to look. And that's when we say culture, that's part of our culture. And we had one agent tell us, um, she said, I would like for us to win more. Like we, we would like to be, I, I would like for all. And I, she said, and there's nothing you guys can do. Like you can't text us and remind us anymore. You can't 
ask us to do it any more than you already do, but we want, I would, I would like for us to be a culture of winners. And I think it was super in fact, impactful for her to say that amongst all of her fellow agents who maybe, you know, on one day or another, you don't pull the weight that you're expected to. And then you, you feel that guilt, but it's not about that guilt. It's about, did you know that the days that you win, you help everybody else win? So I just thought that was such a cool comment that she made. And Denise, so that, that she made the comment and not you, mm-hmm. right? It's one thing for you to say, I'd love us to be a culture, a team of winners, but for them, like you said, to have that ownership and make it from you and them to us was pretty powerful. What are some mm-hmm. examples of um, some action steps that came out of that? Well, mainly we, the main one is we had to figure out how to do the power ups the right way. Um, so that we were, you know, bringing value in the first 30 minutes of their day. What did you do? What did you learn? Like, what did you change them to? We are, are, well, you have to be on video or you have to be in person. We're kind of a hybrid. Not everybody's in the office every single day. So it's really easy not to participate when your camera's off and you're muted, you know, so that. And we all know that from Ben too. He wants cameras on all the time. So that was one of the main things is cameras on and or in person so that we have a little bit more participation because when it's just me or Denise just talking, you know, it's just not as valuable. Um, And we also are bringing in more like what's what wins do you have? What are you looking forward to? What are you excited about? Just more of that, like starting with building up and discussing any, um, any interactions, conversations, any issues that have come up that they would like the whole team to brainstorm around, like what happened, what came up that you would like to hear input on how it could have been handled differently. Um, so just a lot more interactive. Which was only made possible by either sitting in, sitting all together or sitting in front of the camera. I love yeah. that. What else, what else, what are some other action steps that came out of that? Encounter? Well, we learned that our agents would like more consequences. So we are not, we are not (laughs) consequence driven people, but they wanted more consequences. So uh, we didn't have an action step with that, but we thought, okay, what can we, um, maybe what can we do to add more accountability? Because if they feel like they need consequences, it's because we're not providing maybe the environment of accountability. Another thing that was, I think, surprising, and that was an action step for us was we, um, a couple, maybe four months ago, we because started doing what? March or April. Yeah, we started doing these lead generation sessions, which was kind of just like a we we thought, you know, sometimes we sit in here and like nobody makes a phone call for three hours, so why don't we just I'm have so these? Glad we're not the only team. I'm like, what's <laughs> happening? Like, what's like? There, is anyone making a call today? So we decided um, we would have these targeted lead generation sessions. They'd be short. They'd be. They'd include script practice. One of us would lead them. We would literally have all the phones on speakerphone, and as soon as one person answered, the other person went off of speakerphone, and then that way the speakerphone person would have one uh, would have help with their call. So we did these lead gen sessions. We targeted them around one was circle prospecting. One was brevity online leads. One was um, expired and canceled. One was for sale by owners. And we had those. And at first there were, I mean, there were such strict rules. Like if you were late, you couldn't do it. If you missed it one week, you couldn't sign up for the next week. It was limited spaces because we have limited amounts of dialers and limited amount of attention. And we, we really liked it and we felt like it went well, but we thought, okay, well now we've got everyone in the rhythm of doing it and they know what lead generation looks like when it's really targeted and focused. So we'll stop doing them. And that was like one of the things that got asked for as, as something they felt like was super helpful in their business. So they kind of caused us or helped us look back and think, okay, what have we done in the past that we're not doing now that, that really can impact their business. I'm curious, now that you did this once, this exercise once, are you going to do it regularly? Are you going to, are you going to do variations of it regularly? Are you going to kind of insert yourself into different parts of the business? Like, did it change, you know, a cadence of of doing that for you? I'll say, I feel like we've tried to do it before by sending out an anonymous survey or asking maybe one agent at a time, these questions. And I, I don't know what it was about maybe this day or the way that Jamie Lee like 
to kind of set it up, but it felt like we were doing it not as a feedback exercise, but as a like group brainstorming to, we know, we know there are things like, we know there's things that they get annoyed at about with us, or we know that um, there's probably areas where they're like, why are we doing this? So I think having kind of the support of the team where this is, it's like speak now or forever hold your peace kind of thing. This is your open forum to do that. It's not complaining. It's not, um, it's not negative. It's not going to make anyone feel bad. This is your opportunity to shape this team into how you want it to look. So I think maybe we would, I don't think it, it necessarily would be a six month occurrence because it almost, it'll probably take us over six months to really re-implement everything that we, all the action items we took and to make sure that those adjustments were the right adjustments to make in our business. Um, and so far we've held our core group of agents. Um, I mean, pretty, over, I think the one we've, we've been a team for four years yeah. and our, our agents that have been with us from year one, year two, and year three, for the most part, are still with us. So we have this core group. So really, they're involved in the day to day of making these fine adjustments. So I think I would think probably not more than once a year. And I don't know if we'd ever do it this exact way. But Jamie Lee might have a different answer. Well, my answer would be, I just I felt like Denise and I knew we needed to do that. You know, like, it was just kind of a feeling where we're like, we don't know the answers. What, instead of us just guessing and throwing stuff at the wall, like, let's just see what they want. So I think it was, it just was kind of something we knew needed to happen for us to get the results we were looking for. So rather than count like how many months, I think maybe we just act sooner on that feeling than we did this time. You know, you mentioned something that you guys have, you, we've, we've, it's kind of come up a couple of times. You have really good retention and we're still in what I would call that this core group, because like, as you grow to 20, 30, 40, 50 agents, this is going to be the core, right? Certainly that six that you started with, that's still with you. Usually that means you have a productive team. Usually people stay when they're happy and they're doing, you know, productive business. I'm curious, what, what do you think, you know, why, why is your core group so productive? What does their per agent productivity look like? What are their lead sources? Can you kind of, you know, walk us through a little bit what that looks like? Do you want to answer the first part of that? Um, yes. What was the first part? The first so part is, is, um, are they productive and what is their per agent productivity? And then the second part is what are the lead sources? And, you know, I would also say cadence and activity around that. But. Sure. So I don't know that I know the per agent productivity numbers off the top of my head, but I would say that our core agents are definitely our top producers and they are just Com they're committed to success. I would say, um, they're the ones that come to us and say, Hey, what's going on? What do I need to do? Where do I need to be looking for, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever it is that's missing. They're a little bit more, um, tenured agents. I mean, they're, they're not, you know, what, three, four years in the business, Denise. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, but I think they're also really used to the rhythms and the activities and they have, seen, you know, when the weeks I don't hit my contacts or the weeks that I'm not having these appointments, it's going to catch up with me. And I think it's just the repetitiveness of that accountability is just a little bit more instilled in them that they know they have to do the work for the results. And I think to, to answer your question, I also don't know that per agent productivity, but I would say the agents that we feel like are committed to success are generally closing between two and three deals a month. Whereas our new agents, as they start out, are probably closer to one to two every two months until they get more in the rhythm. And one of the one of the reasons that we partnered with Place is we grew grew up real estate wise in a very different market, and so we had different skill sets um, when we started producing, and it took a different amount of activity. So when we started growing the team, we almost felt, in a sense, I think un like not necessarily experts on how to help them get into production. So those conversations in the playbooks that place gave us, we are not the people that are going to look at the playbook, make a hundred edits and then try to implement it. Instead, what we did is we just took everything exactly as it was given to us. 
And we couldn't implement everything at the same time because it's impossible with the amount of content and the amount of um, new activities and new habits that you have to create. But we decided, let's start with one thing. Let's get good at it and let's add something else. So the first thing I think that first productivity rhythm that we really started with was call nights. Mm -hmm. um, and we decided to make them fun. So we had like a luau themed where we played hot potato with a coconut. We've had horse races where and car races where you move your car every time you get a contact. We normally have some sort of prize. Um, we had a 90s night with trivia. So we tried it. We tried. We started with that, I think, because honestly, it was fun. It was a way for our team to spend time together. And also it was a way to, for them to see the results of a really focused two hour lead generation because when else are we that focused on just making calls? So we once we felt like that was working and we had a good rhythm on that, then we moved to the next thing. And instead of us trying to adjust the playbooks that we had, we ran every playbook that place gave us. And then we identified, okay, in addition to everything we've been given, where are our personal gaps and where are the gaps in our agent's business? And that's when we added additional things. Like we do a Tuesday coaching with all the agents where we work on... Um, sales cycle, conversion, getting to the close, uh, teaching them to be salespeople. That's something that just goes on in perpetuity because we know that in this market, honing your skills is so important and we need different skills than maybe we've needed before. Uh, the lead generation sessions were another way for us to address a gap, which is that we didn't have very focused lead generation in the office. So I think the productivity has come from the expectation of these activities and then also creating an environment where, okay, maybe you didn't have, maybe you're not great at first sale by owners. Here are the other things that you can do, or maybe you're not great at online leads. Here's the other thing that you can do. And then Jamie Lee, do you want to mention the challenges too? Cause I feel like that's been a big part of our productivity. Yeah. The, uh, so you mean the challenges they're doing now? No, the, um, just the ones we've done the beach. Trip, oh, the yeah. Effect. So that we do find that our agents and our team, and probably because Denise and I love rewards too, um, we like to attach a prize to different contests that we just will do usually for a month or a couple of weeks, but we've done um, a gift card. We've done uh, like a beach trip as a prize. We've done facials. So we do a lot of those different challenges for, and it's not always the same challenge. So it may be who set the most appointments this month or who had the most contacts this week. Uh, so we really like to gamify things uh, just to keep everyone nice and motivated and make it a little more fun. I'm curious um, what percentage of, of your agent's business roughly, it doesn't have to be exact, is coming from team leads versus leads that they self-generate? Yeah. So I think before this year, aside from maybe, yeah, before this year, we'd never purchased leads before. And a big part of that was learning because the skills that we were learning at that time were targeted more toward uh, the lead sources, the people that were already in our database and the people that we already know and love us. So because our success, Jamie Lee and I's in the past had come so heavily from sphere and database, instead of having someone start out making a thousand cold calls um, immediately to get business, we wanted them to do that as a supplement and to start really treating their database like their main source of business, because we know that that's the, the best business and it's the not easiest because no business is easy, but easiest in the sense that people already trust you. So we have a really robust database and sphere program. Um, we set everything up for them in a way that they can just plug into it, know that their business is being worked, but really the main, I mean, the main component in any sphere program is that you have to talk to your clients. Otherwise it's not going to work. And not only do you have to talk to them, but you have to train them to find referrals and find business for you. And you have to train them to connect that business to you. So we do that a lot through, um, we do like uh, a, a very basic 36 touch program, but now we've kind of grown it to be more in our culture and our, um, what we like to do, what we feel like our community will like to do. We do five to 10 events a year. We've got them on a newsletter. They get a market report every month. They get giveaways. We just give them like a thousand reasons to call their sphere so that they never feel like they're a burden. And we teach them to ask questions in a way that will help them 
generate those referrals and make sure they never miss out on a piece of sphere business. So I would say, I think it's probably, if I had to guess, I'd probably say, I know 2023 for us, 68% was sphere business. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine we're probably somewhere around that as well this year. You know, I just want to make a comment on that, that when you're giving so much value to the self-gen, to what they're self-generating, that they stay and have that longevity and that productivity, that you have a really good team. And, and I think everybody should pause on that a minute. Are your are your value all the leads you're giving or do you have people that come and stay with you because of the value you're giving to boost their self-generation. It is, it is really, really stellar. Cause I mean, that's a low percentage. It's, it's yeah. a low percentage of uh, team leads versus self-gen leads, you know? Yeah. That's um, great. yeah. And I would add to, like Denise said, we've never really paid for leads. I think we've been paying for leads for like three months just to supplement what we've got right now, but we've got one of our brand new agents came on the team. She's been with us a little over a year now. She's closed three or four from circle prospecting. Um, one of our other agents does a ton of for sale by owner. Our, is Aline our newest? She is has just come out the gate and had like three closings. She had a closing from like her second or third open house. So they're really leaning into the playbooks and everything that they're learning in their coaching sessions and from the agents around them so that they're you know, I feel like they're just kind of finding their lanes and what works for them and really maximizing those. Are those open houses, open houses that you're giving them, that the team's giving them? A mix. Yeah. Um, we, when we have our listings, we try to get four open houses a weekend out of them. If we can, if they're vacant, we'll do more than that. Um, but our office is really good too, about having one thing is, <laughs> I don't really know how to say this, but a lot of the agents in our office have been in real estate a really, really long time. So they don't host a ton of open houses. So we have a lot of opportunities, uh, within our office as well. When they circle prospect, is that around team listings? Team listings or just neighborhoods. Um, Jessica mm -hmm. is just killing it with circle prospecting. She came in like her first week as a full-time agent and just cold called her neighborhood. Wow. And she's had two listings in there so far, I think. What scripts are, are is she using? The ones on ourplace.com. <laughs> amazing. That's yeah. really amazing. So they're definitely leveraging and 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 maximizing some of the team's listings and whatnot to lead Jen off of. But um, that's really impressive, ladies. That's that's really, really great. Yeah. Well, and the credit goes to them too, I think, in the sense that they are great about using like once we've told them this is the way you do an open house, they submit their open house, they get their flyers, they get their list put into Mojo for them. And it makes it so that they the work isn't preparing to do the calls. It's just doing the calls and being really confident when you do them and and getting business out. We do that too on our team and, and our, our DOO um, gives them QR codes, um, all their sign-in sheets, everything's done for them. Yeah, we're the same way. It's a huge value we can provide to them, right? I love it. Um, just, oh, if it's okay, I don't want to cut you off. Um, one thing I was just going to say is just listening to you guys talk. I mean, your story is one where you guys left a team. Jamie Lee wanted to be an individual agent. You sort of fought coming together and growing a team. And the sort of approach that you have is so, um, it's almost like performing diagnostics because you guys complement each other so well from the sales side, as well as the operational side, you're always looking at your business, examining it, figuring out how to get better and being super transparent and, and open with your team. And it's such a great lesson for some of us like me who's watching going, I want to grow my team, but then what? And then what happens if I get too big? Then what? I think that overwhelm is so crippling for people. And although you too can be overwhelmed probably pretty quickly, you've kind of fought it and you just sort of take it one step at a time and then layer in another and another. And that's just a great lesson for anyone watching, which is, you know, how do you, how do you eat an elephant one step, one bite at a time. Right. And so, and to not get overwhelmed. So I just wanted to kind of give you guys kudos. You're doing that even just your mannerisms and how you talk like you it's very calming and it's like this is a problem and this is our solution and this is what we're going to do um it's very powerful 
Yeah, well, thank you. I, overwhelmed. I, I was just going to say, I feel like we spend a lot of time <laughs> overwhelmed. Yeah. Speaking of overwhelm, um, out of your team's um, production, and um, I think this year, what are you at this year? You're about 75 year to date. So you'll do about 150, give or take. How many homes will you guys personally sell? I think uh, Denise and I, when we set our goals, we're both somewhere between 25 and 30, I think. Um, we're, our goals aren't exactly the same, but they're pretty close. Do you foresee yeah, and I feel like that will go lower or do you want to keep it there? I think it depends on where, where they need us the most, I would say. Like, I feel like right now we can do what we do and still have our production. And if ever that changed, then we're not opposed to scaling that back. But we do have, we since so much of our business is sphere business, we're, we are still learning to hand that off. And we're learning to figure out which agent will work best with that person and how do we maintain our relationship and keep getting referrals even with handing off our leads. So it's just something that we're a little bit new at and and probably something that we're going to have to work on for the next, I mean, few years at least to get comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. That's a great answer too. Uh, last question I have, unless Sarita has any to add is, you know, I'm curious what, what your biggest challenge is right now, as you look towards the last six months of this year and kind of into 2025, um, what's kind of the overwhelming thought that you, you got a hurdle over? Um, I, I mean, I think for me and Denise, I think is similar. One of the main things is just finding that balance and not feeling overwhelmed, um, because there's so much that we want to do. And we, it's so important to us that all of our agents are into production. We want, you know, everyone to be hitting their goals and the market is just getting harder. Um, so I think as we grow and grow in a harder, a tougher, more difficult market where we're all going to need to level up our skills. I think that is probably where, where we're feeling challenged right now. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. And I, I think just knowing one one part of our kind of going back to our culture and Sarita piggybacking on what you said about the way that maybe the way that we talk about our agents and our team is I think we've held our core group, not just because we're willing to work really hard for them and look for opportunities for them, but also because like we genuinely really care. And that's that makes attrition a lot harder because we are very invested in their lives and we're very invested in their success. And so it's kind of scary to think about this is a challenging market and we are needing different skills and we need to figure out how do we become the leaders that lead them through these markets? How do we provide them enough opportunities to not be the agents that drop out? And as attrition does naturally happen, as it does for many reasons, how do we not let that affect us like mentally and emotionally because it is hard and we want them to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I have so many more questions, but I feel like this is a great spot to, uh, to end our conversation. Cause I think we could talk with these ladies for another full webinar. Don't you think via? Yeah, I think you guys are, you know, um, I, I think the listeners and viewers are really uh, feeling grateful that they tuned in today because you guys are in in the weeds. You are, you know, you're you're working operators, if you will. Right. You're still in it. You're in the business. And it's really extraordinary what you've built having this culture and this retention really based on self-generated leads. I'm kind of blown away by that. Right. So kudos to you ladies. And I'd love to kind of continue following your growth and your trajectory as you guys continue to grow. Cause it's really, it's really a, a joy. You, you exemplify great partnership. Uh, you exemplify women in business, which, you know, is my passion. And so uh, I just think you've done an overall good job and I'm really grateful you spent the time with us. So thank you for, for coming. And I'll put yeah. you guys on the spot and say, we'd love to have you back at a set number of months from now and kind of hear the part two, right? Like, you know, where we, we did the before and where are we now and just follow your growth and trajectory because you guys are so humble with regards to lessons learned and how you've tweaked and, and that's something we can all learn from. Yeah, that's right. So, well, thank, thank you. you. We would love to be back and hopefully tell you about all the agents that hit all their goals. 
in yes. the hardest year of real estate. Right. Well, and next time, those Rita, what happen. do we have next, my friend? What do we, I can't remember what our next webinar is. It's a good question that I don't have in front of me either. Well, we're doing it twice a month. So yes. what, and it's will... July 24th is our next one. So at least get the date down. And I'm just looking now to see. If That's I... a weird date, Sarita. What's going on? It is. It is. My and Kenny and Jennifer Lopez all have birthdays on that day. You all have birthdays on that same date. Um, so I think I'm carrying the reins on that one because Sarita is most likely going to be day drinking on a beach somewhere. I don't know. I hope you are. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to be doing. I'm going to be there, actually. I'm going to be there. So uh, July 24th anyway, it is. I may not let her. She she. I'm requiring sober. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm totally I'm kidding. I did dry January in 2024 and I haven't undried. You yet. haven't. I know. I'm doing really I'm good. Just joking. I'm just joking. So um, We'll talk to everyone the 24th. The topic is um, on a continued conversation on recruiting. So if you thought this was valuable, it's part two of our recruiting series. And it will be Wednesday the 24th at noon. And with that, thank you so much, Jamie Lee and Denise. And Denise, go back to some tacos and yes. beach and vacation. Enjoy. Have fun. Thank Bye. you guys so much. 